Okay, our next presenter is also a recent graduate from family planning. It's Dr. Bon <laughs> family medicine. <laughs> you see, it's it's based on your study there. Family medicine, which is oh, a lot of family planning involved in that. But a recent graduate from family medicine program, Dr. Bon G. L. Gator, who will be presenting the knowledge, attitudes, and practices of clinicians regarding adult vaccines uh, in New Providence and Grand Bahama. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. Good afternoon. My topic is on the knowledge, attitudes, and practices of clinicians regarding adult vaccines, influenza, pneumococcal, and hep B throughout government clinics within Nassau and Grand Bahama. Childhood vaccinations prevent two to three million deaths a year. Adult vaccination is relevant and beneficial. However, the rates lag behind for common adult vaccines, despite local and international guidelines. For example, in the U.S., for influenza in 2014 to 2015, the rates were less than 50% for 18 years and older, and that's far less than the 70% goal for healthy people 2020. For pneumococcal, it was slightly better for the high-risk group, 65 and over, 60, less than 60%, and for Hep B, it was less than 50% for 19 to 49. In the UK, in t for influenza in 2012 and 2013, they actually had a better vaccination rate at 72% for the high-risk groups. But pregnant women are less than 50%. Pneumococcal is close to the 70% goal as well. In the Bahamas, the polysaccharide pneumococcal 23 valent was um, put into place in the national plan in 2013. Since then, in 2014, less than 900 vaccines have been given, and for influenza, less than 9,000. And to put this in, into perspective, the elderly population in the Bahamas was more than 20,000 in 2010. There are 240 million people with chronic Hep B worldwide. In the Bahamas, liver cirrhosis, a possible complication of Hep B, is the fifth leading cause of death in males 25 to 44 years, along with diabetes for the year 2012. So due to the wide effect and implication of these vaccine preventable diseases, the general practitioner, practitioner and all um, physicians that are involved in primary care has to be actively involved in targeting high risk groups to promote vaccinations. I used multiple databases for my literature review. 50 articles were reviewed, 37 were applicable to this study. A study done by Dominicus et al. in 2011 on the knowledge attitudes um, towards influenza vaccination in primary care workers found that adequate knowledge on epidemiology, mode of transmission, and vaccine components did not translate into increased vaccine uptake. Lord et al. in 2013 did a large European study um, using uh, 1,300 primary care physicians, and what they found was that because of low awareness of the disease, the presentations led to decreased vaccine uptake among the physicians and also recommending them. A study done in Abidjan et al. found that there were deficiencies in uh, modes of transmission um, concerning Hep B, as well as the hospitals lacked a strong hospital policy, and that led to decreased hepatitis B vaccinations among physicians and recommending them. To date, no study has been done in the Bahamas investigating how the primary care physician views adult vaccination. Considering the disease burden felt worldwide, it is a safe and effective, cost-effective way to provide protection for high-risk groups. Thus, it was relevant to pursue this topic. So what are the knowledge, attitude, and practices of primary care physicians working in the government clinics in Nassau and Grand Bahama? The research hypothesized that 50% of physicians will have adequate knowledge, attitudes, and practices towards these vaccines, and 50% are unengaged. Here are my objectives, and my study is a descriptive study. It is also a cross-sectional quantitative study design, allowing for a single encounter with eligible interviewing physicians. My target population was any, was, were adult 
physici were physicians that gave primary care to adult patients 19 years and over, including antenatal care throughout the government clinics in Nassau and Grand Bahama. Physicians from eight clinics in Nassau, five clinics in Grand Bahama, including internal medicine and antenatal clinics, were invited to participate. Those that were included, excluded included medical students and allied health. I used the convenience sampling approach, and my sample size of 147 physicians was based on Cochrane's formula. In actuality, 120 questionnaires were given out. However, 91 questionnaires were completed for analysis. My response rate was 75.8%. My questionnaire were adap was adapted from three questionnaires, along with WH fact sheets and CDC fact sheets. And here's the breakdown of my questionnaire. The data was analyzed and full confidentiality was maintained. Descriptive and inferential ana statistical analysis were done on this study. Physicians in the 30 to 39 age group made up the majority of my participants. Two thirds were female and almost 90% were Bahamian. The occupational group with the largest number of participants include the family medicine residents and those that completed a, a residency. There was a positive strong association between age and postgraduate occupational status. Here's a breakdown of the physicians by location in Nassau, and in Grand Bahama. Almost 90% of the participating physicians recommended influenza vaccine followed by hep B and pneumococcal. 80% of the time physicians prompted vaccination requests and 5% of the time patients asked. More than half of physicians recommend vaccines during well and ill visits, 25% during a national vaccine campaign. And of note, it was noticed that when the physician aged, these older groups were more likely to vaccinate during the national program, national vaccine program, and this was statistically significant. Physicians strongly agree that vaccine programs are beneficial and disagree that they cause unknown illnesses and weaken the immune system. Close to 90% of physicians were knowledgeable about flu transmission, severity, and epidemiology. Of note, the statement on, he on healthcare workers being reservoirs for influenza disease had the lowest, but this was still over 50%. Hmm. Fifty percent of physicians correctly identified all high-risk groups, except for the 75, the, the adults over 75. Ninety percent of physicians recognize the vaccine is given annually, and more than 50 percent recognize that it's a trivalent vaccine that we have on the national government plan. Physicians rated patients age, health, tolerability, and health authority recommendation as being very important in their decision to recommend the flu vaccine. In practice, median flu monthly numbers are five to nine. The two predictors of flu vaccine recommendations in this study was the physician's personal last flu vaccine in the last five years and the clinic sites listed here. Family Medicine, Sunderland's Geriatric, and Elizabeth Estates Clinic were the sites that were most likely to receive the flu vaccine and in turn recommend it. And this was compared to the OBGYN physicians. The most common reason the physicians were not thinking about the vaccine, the most common reason why the flu vaccine is not recommended is that it's not on top of their mind. They're not thinking about it. More than 50% of physicians identify the high-risk groups for invasive pneumococcal disease, except for smokers and alcoholics. More than 50% identified high-risk groups for complications for pneumonia, including adults over 65. However, again, the adults 75 years and over were identified by only um, 47%. Almost 90% of physicians correctly identify strep pneumonia as the leading cause. For the pneumococcal vaccine, the patient's age, duration of protection, tolerability, and health authority recommendations were very important. Reimbursement and cost for this vaccine is more important to the physician in comparison to the flu. Monthly pneumococcal vaccines were zero to four. 24% recommend this vaccine during above a certain age each visit. 
Two thirds of the physicians chose that the vaccine, again, is not at the top of their mind as a reason for sometimes not recommending. Nearly 90% of physicians correctly knew that three doses complete the Hep B series. There was a greater percentage of females that got this answer, and this was a very strong relationship that was statistically significant. More than 50% of physicians identified high risk groups for contracting Hep B. And less than 60% of physicians recognize Hep B as safe for all ages. And almost 40% feel it's contraindicated in pregnancy. Less than 30% identified that patients with end stage renal disease should have had the vaccine if not received it, if they haven't received it before. Okay, concerning Hep B transmission, almost a third answered all of the above, which incorrectly included fecal oral as a mode of transmission. Monthly Hep B vaccines are zero to four, and annual vaccines in the previous year had scores of three. Overall, 80% of physicians have a positive opinion of these vaccines. Okay. In my study, the female gender was the two-thirds of my population, which is representative of what, um, um, what, what is in our general population for physicians overall. Okay, this had no bearing on the frequency of vaccination recommendations. Unlike Nicole et al., uh, which found that female primary care doctors were more likely to recommend influenza and pneumococcal. The fact that 80% of the time physicians initiated vaccination is comparable to Lode et al., which means that a greater responsibility lies with the healthcare worker to educate and initiate. Decreased percentage of, of physicians acknowledged healthcare workers are reservoirs for the virus and that caretakers of children are at high risk. There's room for education. 40% did not receive the flu vaccine between 2010 to 2015, and antenatal patients were only identified by 50% but in practice, only 23% recommend the vaccine. Study done by Dexter et al. Re, um, reinforces that active recommendation by healthcare provider is vital to the uptake in antenatal patients. Almost 60% of physicians adequately identify patients at risk for invasive pneumococcal disease. About one third of study participants said the vaccine was either not available or sporadically available in clinics. Health authority recommendation was important for both flu and pneumococcal vaccine, but it did not necessarily translate into high percentages of recommendations and screening for certain risk groups. Concerning the present pneumococcal vaccine, the statement vaccine protects against strains most resistant to antibiotic treatment. Um, there appears to be a division in whether the vaccine protects against this. Um, physicians had a bimodal distribution of 25% neutral and 24% said they somewhat agree. So the implications are that physicians may choose treatment for pneumococcal diseases over prevention. The main barrier to vaccination is the mindset of the physician, followed by having no time to convince patients on the efficacy of the, of the vaccines. For hepatitis B, there were deficits in knowledge. More than 20% indicated a fecal oral route. And as the physician aged, there is more of a belief that the vaccine is safe, so there's a need to educate the younger physicians. In conclusion, I'm pleased to say that my hypothesis was incorrect, that more than 50% of primary care physicians working in the Bahamas government clinic settings have the adequate knowledge concerning each of the vaccines studied. More than 80% have a positive attitude or opinion of these vaccines. There are hindrances to practices, including missed opportunities to immunize high-risk groups. Older patients should be kept in the forefront as the morbidity and mortality of these groups are higher. Educating and increased screening and immunizing high-risk groups against Hep B is vital. My limitations included a small sample size. My questionnaire had 75 questions. There, were physician, there was much physician mobility between the clinics. Completed statistics in the Bahamas are unavailable, and my questionnaire did not address fully the barriers to Hep B vaccination. Recommendations to increase knowledge base. CME should focus on benefits, safety, and efficacy of the vaccines, highlighting high-risk groups. Hepatitis B, for hepatitis B vaccines, CMEs, especially for younger physicians, should be made available. 
a multifaceted plan similar to what, was, what is mentioned in Holmeyer et al. on interventions to increase uptake of flu in healthcare workers may help. So clarity on the national screening plan, especially for Hep B, public campaigns before initiating vaccine drives, incentives to the physicians, organizational changes such as electronic health records, um, review studies on mandatory policies for immunizations, encourage the use of standing orders, and stress the benefit of vaccination decreasing overall health costs. Better communication among phys physicians and allied help. Allied health is a must. Physician re reminders are a must. And to ensure vaccines are physically present and available for use at all times. At this time, I just want to thank all of my colleagues that took the time from their schedule to complete my questionnaire. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Dr. Gator. We have a question. Do you think, thank you, do you think to support your findings it would have been useful to have an arm that asked the physicians whether they themselves had received these vaccines? Um, yes, I, I, I'm sorry, I did ask about the influenza vaccine, um, whether the physicians um, actually get the vaccine because that's one of the promoters to recommend the vaccine. Okay, uh, most of my physicians are under the age for the pneumococcal vaccine. So that wouldn't have been relevant to them. And many of them don't have comorbid um, diseases that would make them able to get the vaccine. And for hepatitis B, I made an assumption that most of our doctors that are working have it. I realized that afterwards. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I, I wish it wasn't just an assumption because every doctor working should be hepatitis B vaccinated. Secondly, although I'm happy, you were happy that your premise was proven incorrect, eight out of 10 is still not enough. 80% of doctors who believe in vaccines, I'm still worried that there's 20% who don't. So we still have some work to do. Thank you very much, Dr. Gitter. So our next speaker, um, probably needs no introduction, is our esteemed leader, Dr. Robin Roberts. And Dr. Roberts asked for a very short intro and that's what he's going to get, but let me just tell you that he was a graduate of the urology postgraduate program at University of Dalhousie and did a fellowship after that in renal transplantation. And of course he's now our, one of our leading urologists and the uh, leader of our medical school as well, and he's going to talk about the challenges and realities with respect to establishing a renal transplantation service in the Bahamas. Good afternoon. 50 years, 60 years ago, the first renal transplant was performed in the world. This was done in Boston, and it was a success because they were identical twins. O others were not so fortunate because the complications of immunosuppression for non-identical twins were very high, such that at least in, within, uh, in the beginning, almost 100% of patients who receive a kidney transplant died within the first year. As the immunosuppression uh, use and its doses and new medications came into being, this improved such as most patients survived at least the first year of transplantation. Many of you would recognize from different strokes uh, uh, Gary Coleman, who was quite clearly, he had a major problem with renal failure and he was on transplantation. And you can see that this is quite different from uh, the cyclosporin era in which you'd recognize now which one of these, mother and daughter, which one had the transplant. And so the advantages of immunosuppression, advances in transplantation and organ donation have been great. We notice now that in the new millennium that most individuals who have a transplant, they will survive whether they lose the transplant or not. And most grafts will function well, uh, well beyond a year. In fact, we expect, in, it's particularly in those where we have live donor transplants, that at five years old, almost 90% plus of them will still be functioning. We 
uh, missed my point. So renal transplantation has become extremely successful, as you can see compared with other, with, uh, with the other uh, transplants. And it's very clear that patients survive longer with transplantation compared to those who are on dialysis. And it's also very clear that it's much more cost effective to have transplantation, as you can see in the, in the red bar, to those individuals on the, or in the uh, blue and the orange that have transplantation, whether they're hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, and compared to all incidents of rent stage renal failure. So not only is transplantation cheaper, you have a better quality of life, you last longer, that transplantation has become the treatment of choice for individuals who have end stage renal disease. So it bears to mind that this is when I came home that we uh, had a dialysis, we had a dialysis unit. And so it was very clear looking at the data that end stage renal failure in blacks is much more common, about four times to five times more common. Most of it, we have a predominance of hypertension and diabetes, which are the leading causes of end stage renal failure. And we have now in the Bahamas over 400 patients just in the government sector alone on transplantation. 50% uh, of them are diabetics, or almost 20% of them are hypertensive. And our studies from our postgraduate students tells us that it costs our, 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 you, the taxpayer, approximately $75,000 per year per patient on dialysis. So the 700-pound gorilla in the, or the elephant in the room is asking a very clear question. Then why is it that in the Bahamas, we can't get a kidney transplant? Well. Uh, 30 years ago, I had this in mind and opted to do a kidney transplant. At that time at Dalhousie, uh, we had the single leading center catering for four provinces. We did approximately 100 transplants per year. And so I came home as a urologist and I was going to bridge this urological divide. There were many challenges where we, we could overcome them. My, my colleagues in Canada said they were quite happy to come down and assist us. We made contact with the University of Miami Transplant Services. They were very happy to come and assist us. Uh, we had uh, Dr. Sawyer who has had his uh, fellowship and he felt quite confident that we could manage our patients with transplantation. So while they were some unsurmountable, we felt that they were very surmountable. So therefore I took on the further that we, I'm gonna be the bull in the China shop and we're gonna make this transplantation uh, service to come to being. I also believe very strongly that first world medicine is designed for third world countries. And if we look at all those aspects that have survived, they have survived because they are more efficient, they're more cost effective, they lead to better quality of life. And so I felt that transplantation should fit right into this. So what were our resources? Well, money was an issue, but we felt that we could overcome that. If you could afford dialysis, as far as I'm concerned, you can afford transplantation. Materials. We felt that if you could get the materials for dialysis, you could get the materials for transplantation. We should be able to afford drugs. And of course, we know very clearly that the fact that we are a small developing country doesn't mean that we can be a center of excellence and we can perform just as well as the bigger countries. And so we felt, yes, we can. We can make this quantum leap with all these nice new dreams of what we could do. What do we need to have? Well, you can't do transplantation without kidneys. So we're not have kidneys. So, we looked at this and we said, all right, uh, what are the obstacles? Who is going to give it? How are we going to get it? Uh, when are we going to get it? And uh, what are we going to do with it when it comes about? So this was the first primary concern I had in trying to start this program. But I was very aware of the potential for disasters. Uh, in our program in Halifax, I was reminded that when they had done everything right and they committed to do their first transplant, that the, the, the donor died on the way from the operating theater. So I was very cognizant that I didn't think we could survive something like that. So we sought to go for a cadaveric donor. So the first thing I did, uh, not I, but along with my other colleagues, this is Dr. Weichuan, he was a medical student. I mean, he was an intern. So we looked to see what was the potential for us to get organ donors. We presented this at CHRC in 1988. And uh, this was the publication in 1999 in the, in the transplantation proceedings. At that time in our intensive care unit, we knew exactly what was going on because it was the only intensive care unit at that time. Doctors Hospital didn't have one. We had 351 admissions, 107 deaths. 
and we, we looked at it that we, in that age group from 5 to 65, there were eight potential donors. And we felt this was fantastic because at that time we had 40 patients on dialysis and we said, you know something, in five years time we could have everybody off dialysis. This is fantastic. And that would not have been bad. So again, we felt that we could drag everyone along with us. If we had to, we know that, uh, that uh, it's going to be a long journey. But the truth of the matter, when you come back home and you really learn to see how things work, as I always say, when you're up to your neck in alligators, you fail to remember your primary purpose was to drain the swamp. And so you get what is called culture shock, and many of it which we still see today. You got shortages, you have inefficiencies, you got no money, you have bureaucracy, you have no policies, no procedures, and in fact, instead of going into the rising and trying to be the bull in the china shop, you really feel as if you're walking through a maze, and this is, this is just a, how are you gonna get where you're gonna go? And in fact, I felt I ended up in the brick wall. We had so much resistance to getting the program started that I realized that I was actually a fish out of water. So let me go and do my urology and leave this transplantation alone. And uh, about exactly 10 years later, after I'd given up the thought of doing transplants, an angel came bearing gifts. <laughs> I had an 18-year-old girl who came into the clinic, my urology clinic, and she said, I came to you because they told me you do kidney transplants. My sister's on the island in Idusra. She's gonna come to Nassau to be on the kidney machine. Uh, we can't afford her to be in Nassau, and I God has sent me to give her a kidney. And uh, so, she seemed as if she was very sincere. And so a few months later, we did our first transplant in the Bahamas. That's when I had some hair on my head. I had Dr. Sawyer at a younger stage. And that's my colleague from, from, free, from uh, Canada who came, Dr. Joe Lowen, and that was Dr. Ronald Nose. Uh, this patient actually died 12 years later. She lost her kidney after about 10 years when uh, she uh, could not afford a medication and started to cheat. So there was no doubt in our minds that we could do successful transplantation. You might have seen this inside the Bahamas Air uh, magazine, if you're flying at that time. This is another patient who we did. Uh, this is a sister who gave him transplant. So we felt we were on our way. If we could do a couple of transplants a year, this thing would be the way to go. Unfortunately, 10 years passed and we had only done an extra three. So we realized that maybe this is not the way to go. And then, at that time, for many of you might know that one of the hottest things that we have today is what we call the altruistic donor. So this is a big thing in the States now. People go online, uh, they go on the radio, they make a plea. And with our advances in immunosuppression, individuals, regardless of whether you are closely related, can donate, patient, can donate a kidney to someone who is totally unrelated and have good results. So in this element of altruism, of course, in America, there are places where they would think this is unethical. They're thinking that people are setting organs under the table and what kind of contracts are made. So, while this might have been, not have been pervasive throughout the United States, there are those who felt this was an opportunity for health tourism. So we had a group that actually came and approached us as to whether we can, have a, we can set up this altruistic donation in the Bahamas. They are quite prepared to go into the U.S., seek towards having uh, our donors, and they could come to the Bahamas and be transplanted. And uh, so we say, this is fantastic. So, we looked seriously then at implementing a formal transplantation program at the doctor's hospital to minimize the bureaucracies that we would need to have. And so along with Dr. Sawyer and our two able assistants, uh, Dr. Sherry, uh, uh, Sherry Martin and, and Nova, we had a formal transplantation service that we established at doctor's hospital. So we had the local team, we had this potential international team, we had a physician team, uh, the nephrologist came on board as well, we had a transplant coordinator, Ms. Martin. We had another nursing team. We set up protocols and policies. All doctors' hospitals sponsored the nurses to go to Halifax, where we were. They were in the unit for months. We got all our policies in place. We got all our procedures in place. And uh, we were quite certain that we were going to do live donor trans uh, transplantation because we'd be able to plan our, our procedure. We'd be able to make sure that everything was in perfect condition and that was the way where we were to go. Later on, we will deal with cadaveric care, uh, cadaveric donors, but we realized that the private sector would be the way for us to go, at least in the beginning. So over, that, over the ensuing 
uh, six plus years, this is what happened to our transplantation unit. We met very frequently, as often as once every week, and then slowly once every two weeks and once every month, depending on the demand. But over that period of time, we had 40 potential donors. We had 40 potential recipients. 20 of them actually came in and registered formally. 11 were, uh, were family members, sibling, parents, offsprings. Nine were non-family members. 12 had completed all the evaluation. 20 people submitted via phone, but they never came in, but they expressed their interest. They were gonna give on behalf of somebody. But the truth of the matter is that 28 of them had less than 25% of the, of the uh, evaluation done. 15 were insured, they had major medical, so these are private patients, we were very hopeful. 23 were non-insured, we didn't know the status of four of them. 17 had no donors identified at all who came forward and wanted to transplant. 18 all had their pre-op evaluations and the referrals from our three nephrologists, we can see that each unit made a contribution. So what we really found, after all of the 40, 42, nine pairs completed evaluation. Unfortunately, we had one donor who, uh, after this successful uh, evaluation, we found that she had a hypoplastic kidney, so we couldn't use her. Four patients died uh, waiting for their transplantation to occur. We had another four that were, that were matched and we felt great this would be. The insurance companies denied us they felt that we were not a set of excellence, and so they said we could be a transplant them if they go to the United States. So after six years and all of the meetings and work, we actually ended up with one pair and one transplant. And so we also realized it took us on average about a year to complete the evaluations, and just to say that 10 patients died on that waiting list hoping to get a transplant. So we realized that those who did not complete the evaluation Basically, they couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford the biochemistry, they couldn't afford the consultations, they couldn't afford the imaging, and the total cost was approximately about eight to $9,000. So, we also found only one public patient, although they represent more than 75, 70%, came forward and made a, uh, a request. Of course, they could not proceed anywhere. Um, the, the, uh, again, there we had a lot of inquiries but you can see they couldn't afford it. The total package we pegged our transplantation was $85,000. In the US, they start off with a deposit of $120,000. So we thought we were given very good value for money. And uh, the truth of the matter is that only those who could afford it could get it. They just could not access it. So I felt that at the end of the time, we really came to a blank. But you know, I believe that if you reach a fork in the road, you gotta take it. And that the, uh, yes we can, you know the difference between success and failures is jumping on the opportunities. And so another angel came bearing gifts to us one day, and this would have been in the early 90s. I walked through doctor's hospital and there was a patient who I saw a friend I met, and she was obviously uh, very distraught and crying, and I asked what happened, and she said her husband had just had a a cerebrovascular accident, and they declared him that he was gonna die, and she didn't know what to do. And I went and found that, he, yes, he was brain dead, and I asked, why don't you donate the kidney? She says, I would love to do that. Uh, how could we arrange to have this kidney donated so I could remember him further? So I remember we had our relationships with the University of Miami Transplant Service, so I gave him a call. I said, would you like to come and harvest some organs? And they said, why not? We'll be there in four hours' time, get the team together. So I thought this was a time for us to start an international uh, um, uh, cooperation. And so I had to think in my mind within four hours, how could we get some, a group of foreign doctors to come into the Bahamas and harvest organs from Bahamians and take back? So I had to get the family consent. I talked to the CMO and the medical council so that they could be registered, and they agreed. I spoke to the permanent secretary who said, you must talk to the minister who agreed. Uh, I called the director of immigration to tell them that these foreigners were coming into the country and they would have temporary license to do the practice and they agreed. And then I talked to the customs officers and tell them that these folks are gonna carry the organs back outside. And they say, okay. So we arranged this within, the, within four hours and the team came. And uh, this was our first patient. They wrote me back at the time that we had gotten this. And uh, that person 
had donated from that one individual, they gave their heart and their left and right kidneys. And so we thought this was great. We have another opportunity. Now we can talk about cadaveric transplant. And so we waited for the opportunity that we can afford uh, our uh, live donors again, and we could, I mean, our cadaveric donors again. And we started this relationship. And over the ensuing eight years, 10 years, these are the patients whom we identified as having, uh, br they were brain dead and called over the Miami team and they harvested the organs. And these were the organs that were collected. Quite a variety of the numbers that we had done, but we couldn't keep them because we couldn't donate them. And uh, so other than the eyes, we kept a couple of, of, of corneas, but what are you going to do? We didn't have a trans, we didn't have a, a, a waiting list, we didn't have people prepared for a waiting list. And then, you know, there are lots of nice stories that happened from this. The second person whom we harvested all the organs, we did all of this at doctor's hospital. And even though some of the patients were from Princess Margaret Hospital, the government made it very clear. They said, yes, we'll agree, but no harvesting is going to be done in the PMH because the last thing we want is to have a punch story or any other story that says the government has given black organs to people in America. And so we would transfer them to, uh, to doctor's hospital. We would keep our organ alive. And then the second patient that we did, you know, you've taken out all the organs, you sew the patient up. Well, we already know the cause of death, so the coroner, so the, uh, the more, the, so they called right away the funeral director, funeral home came, pick up the organ. The next day, when they went to embalm and opened up and found no organs, they called the police and say we had body snatches. And they came to arrest us. <laughs> and so the coroner was very partial to us, and so we actually had a coroner's hearing. We had to take our lawyer. Fortunately, Dexter Johnson was a lawyer at the time, and we made the case. The coroner was very partial to us, and so we actually defined guidelines in the absence of a tissue act for harvesting from cadaveric patients. And so the reality was that we had procurement resources. Okay, uh, we didn't have to worry. We had good people could come, and we could have good organs. It didn't cost us anything. Uh, and in fact, it was a little productive because Medicare paid for the harvesting, and uh, we had the first choice of the organs that were harvested. We actually had a Bahamian who got a heart and another Bahamian that got a liver, uh, so we had a potential to get back, and we also had some Bahamians who could get on the transplant list in America because we had given some organs and so forth. But people would question, is this uh, uh, we, uh, this is David and Goliath, are they exploiting us? Well, we were hoping that we would be able to harvest those organs and give them into the Bahamians, but we struck blank again. And we struck blank again because we couldn't get a transplant list to get a lift, at least we could get all the patients who were in the Princess Margaret Hospital, if we could get them tissue type, if we could have them ready, then when those organs became available, we could give it to them. And then, of course, when we did have a case like that where we harvested and we had a patient who actually was matched, a private patient with the insurance, the insurance company refused to pay for it. So we had the system working against us. And so what it really boiled down as far as we are concerned is these were the trials and tribulations of doing renal transplantation in the Bahamas. And so where we are right now is the fact is that our transplantation, our dialysis, numbers are going up, uh, and here is what's happening in the world. We have more people on dialysis. Uh, yes, we might have some increase in terms of transplantation, but it's quite clear that the gap is widening. You can look at it from another direction and say that the, the percentage of patients on a waiting list who actually get transplantation is decreasing. And the fact of the matter is that every 10 minutes, someone is added to the national transplant list in America, but on average, 21 people die each day while waiting for transplant. And for you who know in the Bahamas that quite a number of our patients, that's the only thing that keeps our numbers steady at our high death rate. So finally where we are then, we realize that organ donation is it's a real integrated system. You need how to maintain organ, how to harvest organs, the hospital policy, the organ legislation, the donor. So it's a major enterprise. And on top of that, the transplantation itself requires follow-up care, and it's lifelong, and the medication are expensive. But here are the facts. Number one, it's cheaper than what we're doing now. Number two, I challenge you to recognize somebody down the street who has a transplant. They're back to work normal. 
they paying international insurance instead in, in, in the set of them paying back and they paying their taxes instead of us trying to support it. So finally, we have to appreciate that transplantation analysis is a collective effort, uh, collective in terms of providing a service and in terms of paying for the service. And that payment, okay, has to be the collective effort. Now, we have to be creative. We have to face the realities that the reason why transplantation is successful in America is because Medicare and Medicaid pay for it. The reason it's successful in Canada is because the Canadian government pays for it. The reason it's successful in Europe is because the government pays for it. So, and they realize that because only those who have money would be able to pay for it. One of the biggest healthcare disparities that we have. And so if you have no money, you have no care. So we've got to find a means whereby we can actually say that everybody has access, true access to healthcare of good quality. And uh, so I suspect that this is not going to come on board until we have a national health insurance service that's going to be prepared. And so we can have a system that's modern that's affordable, everyone can access to get this started. And I would say that we've been through it, and nothing will ever be attempted if all possible objections must be overcome first before we get going. And I leave for all of those in the pioneering spirit, and the words of Ayn Rand, is that throughout centuries there were men who took first steps down new roads armed with nothing but their vision. Thank you very much. How much time? Yeah, have time for this. Ah, time for this. So, I could see that we were all fixated on this particular very well done presentation. And uh, I commend you, Dr. Roberts. I'm opening up the floor for one or two questions. Number one. Uh, Dr. Roberts, excellent presentation. I admire your persistence. Um, Were they ever prepared to pay for those patients who had insurance to go off to get the same process done at a much greater cost? Yes, they did. Actually, they sent the patients off the day, despite the fact that I said that I would have my colleagues come down who are in centers in the Canada. They would fly down immediately. And we had all the, all the members in the team were members who were credentialed specialists. And we had all the protocols that were state of the art and to be prepared to deliver. They said no. So I don't know how you start these things in developing countries, you know. Um, I thought that was a very good and depressing presentation. <laughs> no. uh, it only shows how far behind we are. This is almost 30 years now, and we have been able to get this off the ground. And I think kidney transplants are probably the easiest of the solid to transplant. One thing that you mentioned is that we had some sort of a relationship with the University of Miami where we were sort of building up credits for our patients to be transplanted in the US. And I'm wondering how come that wasn't sustained so that, you know, if we have potential donors here, that they can continue to come over and harvest the office office and then we can have this credit so that patients who were eligible for transplant. It is there. They they they, they just we just don't have a medium whereby we can say to them that uh, we want to have formally these patients that are available, but if those patients actually make the effort, then we have quite a number of them on a transplant list. But don't forget in America now, they, have to, they give preference. They are guided by UNOS, they are the uh, national organ system in the States, and they are very clearly defined when organs are in the States, who gets them first. Right, but if they're, trying, they're harvesting organs from the Bahamas. Yes. There must be some allowances yeah. They are. They are. They are, but they don't. They are not given the high, the same high priority as Americans. That's those are the facts. Uh, you know, the, the other thing that you can't ignore. You know, uh, I, I and I say this without reservation, that there are greater benefits to have patients on dialysis than to be transplanted. But I leave that for another day.
questions? Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Roberts. Dr. Jason Thompson is our next presenter. And uh, I'm substituting for Dr. Ramphal. He had to run to do an emergency procedure. And um, I'm going to turn over now to Dr. Thompson. He's from internal medicine, he's a, a resident. Uh, he's doing his presentation, which actually is his culminating project as far as the research side is concerned. And uh, please enjoy the presentation and wish him well as he goes for his final exams next year. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Jason Thompson. I'm from the Department of Internal Medicine. Today I'll be presenting on the usefulness of the rock call score to predict high-risk lesions in patients presenting with upper GI bleeds. So in our setting, GI bleeds are a very common emergency room visit and a very common cause of hospitalization in our country. Um, just to give you an example of what our numbers are like, in the Department of Internal Medicine, we have about six to eight admissions per night, which works out roughly to uh, about 700 or so patients per quarter. We also have challenges where we have limited resources and we have limited manpowers. As a result, we need to risk stratify patients in order to see which patients can be managed as outpatients, which patients can be managed as inpatients. In our hospital, our average wait time for endoscopy is approximately five days versus the international standards which suggest that these patients should have endoscopy within the first 24 hours of admission. On average, our patients spend about two weeks in hospital and at an average daily rate of about 7,655, sorry, $765. It works out to be an annual rate that the hospital spends on patients presenting with upper GI bleeds to about $728,000. Once again, I reiterate that there is a strong need for restratification of these patients in order to help cut costs. In so the scoring system that we used was the Rockall score. The Rockall score was first developed in 1996 and it's a mortality risk assessment for patients admitted to the hospital with upper GI bleeding. In the initial validation study uh, of the rock scores, 32 of the 2,500 patients would work out to be about 4% of those patients who had a score of less than two rebled, and only one patient in this group died. The scoring system uh, was deemed to be reliable in identifying patients who may die from upper GI bleed, but a little less accurate for those patients um, who rebled. As a result, it was deemed suitable to restratify patients who met criteria for early discharge, and that was those patients with a score of less than two. So the rock all score has a pre-endoscopy component as well as a post-endoscopy component. Your pre-endoscopy component it involves your age, your patient's hemodynamic status, and comorbidities. Those comorbidities with higher risks of, reading, of bleeding, um, such as chronic kidney disease, liver failures, and malignancies were given a higher score than all other chronic medical illnesses. In the post rockall score, uh, post endoscopy rockall score, uh, patients were are uh, given scores based upon what their diagnosis was at endoscopy and with the, whether or not there was any stigmata of bleeding. Patients with Mallory Weiss tears or normal endoscopy has got a score of zero. Patients with malignancies got a score of two and all others got a score of one. Um, patients with no blood in the GI tract or just a dark spot um, were given a score of zero. Those with blood in the GI tract, meaning an inherent clot or a spurting vessel, were given a score of two. So what exactly do these scores mean? 
So patients with less than uh, two, those patients have a very low risk of, of mortality. Patients with scores higher, four to six, have a probability score of anywhere between 25 to 50 percent. And then the post endoscopy rocker score, patients with less than two had a score, had a percentage uh, mortality of less than one. So our study design was a prospective study conducted here at the Princess Margaret Hospital between September and November of 2015. It was non-randomized and we took consecutive patients as they came and presented to the emergency room. Our aim was to determine what our causes of upper GI bleeding was, whether or not this score was effective in our system, and also we wanted to determine our morbidity and our mortality rates that have been associated with GI bleeds in our population. So patients who were excluded from our study, those that were 18 who weren't able to consent, patients who were managed as outpatients, and those who did not have endoscopy performed during that admission. So during the study period, we randomized 26 patients. Seven of those were discharged from the emergency room for various reasons. Um, two of the patients were under 18, and this left us with a total of 17 patients during the time that met our inclusion criteria. So our results are as follows. Uh, we had the same amount of patients with less than 60 and between the ages of 60 and 80. About 75% of our patients were male and about 35% of our patients admitted to either NSAID use or being on anticoagulant. Our number one um, cause of GI bleeding was found to be peptic ulcer disease. We also had three patients during the study period that were found to have GI malignancies. And two patients in the study had normal endoscopy despite having been admitted for GI bleeds. So during our study, we noted that we had four patients that met criteria based on the rock call score to be discharged home. However, as we can see, out of the four patients, we had actually had three patients that had complications. One patient died from a massive PE, and two of our patients ended up needing surgery, both for malignancies. So after we calculated the post rock call score, we noted that uh, patients between um, rock call scores of three to four, um, which accounted for nine patients, they had significant uh, morbidity and mortality associated with them as well. So these findings may seem as if the rock call score does not work in our system. And most likely with an uh, average of nine to 10 patients presenting with upper GI bleeding every month, we probably never will have a large enough study in this population to uh, actually validate its use. But what we can take away from this data is that in addition to these absolute numbers, your change in your rock call score may be just as important. We also need to develop a score for ourselves that fits our uh, population and our setting. Um, and we also need to address our inefficiencies in terms of personnel and resource use. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thompson. Questions? Going? Going? Really, really going? All right, so in the Department of Medicine, we have two days to scope patients, um, Tuesdays and Thursdays. We don't have a 24-hour system. Um, is usually due to one anesthetist being on call, um, no nurses available, 
Um, and if the patient presents on a Thursday, they will have to wait until the next Tuesday unless it's in, you can get them on the emergency list. Are you satisfied with that? Not at all. That was an easy question. Pardon? Um, we have three um, colonoscopes and we have three upper scopes as well. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. <laughs> I'm going to introduce to you the next speaker, Dr. Don Major. He's a, a surgeon, recent graduate from the DM program in general surgery. And uh, over the years, he has been steady at presenting at conferences and we're delighted to hear from you today again, Doctor. So please, help us to see some of the outcomes of laparoscopic colorectal surgery in the Bahamas. All right, good afternoon all. Um, seeing that I'm the last speaker, I'll try not to keep you guys here past midnight. Um, today I want to go through briefly our outcomes of laparoscopic colorectal surgery in the Bahamas. I'd like to start off by letting you guys know that I have nothing to disclose. A brief outline, introduction, objectives, results, conclusion. So minimally invasive surgery has revolutionized the way in which operations are performed. Open surgery required long incisions, extended hospitalization, but this has since changed due to the increasing use of laparoscopy. Laparoscopy has actually been around for over, cent uh, over a century now, and usually in the earlier days, it was just for looking on the inside of the abdomen to determine exactly what is going on. And then it started to kind of pick up in gynecology. They tend to use it a bit more. But it wasn't until the 1980s when we started using it for laparoscopic cholecystectomies, that basically the role of laparoscopy kind of skyrocketed. The benefits of laparoscopy in patients undergoing colectomy for colon cancer was actually initi initially considered in the 1990s. Before it was just usually used for benign disease such as ulcerative colitis, um, diverticulosis, and the reason for this is that they had questions about the role of laparoscopy and colon cancer. Some of the questions that they wanted to answer was, was there a proper oncological resection that occurred during laparoscopy? And did the lymph node harvest actually coincide with that of open surgery? Also, were the patterns of tumor dissemination actually altered with the use of laparoscopy as well as the pneumoperitoneum? Some of the initial studies actually showed that wound and port site recurrence rates were pretty high at 21%. But well, most of these questions are actually answered in a non-inferiority study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, I think in about 2004. What they looked at, they said that the lymph node harvest was actually similar to that of open, and they found that port site and wound recurrences were only 0.5%. They also found that there were some benefits to laparoscopy, such as decrease in length in hospital stay, as well as a decrease in use of narcotics. Also, patients noted that they didn't have these big surgical scars so they can move around a bit earlier and it's better cosmesis for them. Some of the disadvantages that we incurred as well is the increased operative time and then there was a 21% conversion rate. So the purpose of this study was actually to characterize the outcomes of laparoscopy or laparoscopic colectomy performed in the Bahamas by a surgical oncology service. We have a prospectively held database of consecutive laparoscopic cases performed between 2009 to 2016, and this was reviewed. The data was divided into three basic categories, the patient's demographics, the procedure details, the outcomes, both short and long term. A case series design basically was done between this hospital, Princess Margaret, as well as Doctors Hospital as a clinical audit. The population consisted of patients seen at either hospitals and in need of a colectomy. 
and these were patients admitted from 2009 to 2016. We went back and looked at their charts where we got the demographics, um, including their age, the gender, the diagnosis, type of surgery, stage of tumor, operative time, time to return of bowel function, hospital stay, as well as 30-day mortalities. A pro form was created in Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. The, there was direct data entry into the charts from the spreadsheet, and the data was clean and basically doubly entered and um, corrected for any errors and then placed in SPSS. We were able to get some st the descriptive statistics showing frequencies, percentages, tables reporting the above statistics, as well as related charts and histograms. Um, we also had some inferential statistics and we found a critical p-value for comparison to be statistically significant for equal to or less than 0 0.05. When we looked at basically our study, we just had a pretty small sample size of 20 patients. And when we looked at the age, basically the mean age was around 62 years with a standard deviation of eight years. We also looked at the gender basic distribution, which was pretty much equal, 50-50, for male to female ratio. We again looked at the body mass index, and we noticed that the majority of the patients, or the average amount of patients, are actually overweight, with a BMI of 26, uh, with a standard deviation of 4.7. And again, when we looked at it comparing the hospitals, we noticed that the majority of our cases were done actually at doctor's hospital, which accounted for about 65% of the cases. When we looked at the American Society of Anesthesiology Grading System, or the ASA classification, the majority of our patients were between grades one and grade two. The indications for surgery actually were for benign disease, accounted for 30% of the cases, in situ malignancy, 5%, and invasive malignancy, accounted for 75% of the cases. When we looked at the distribution of the lesions, about 57.9% of them were on the right side of the colon, 26.3% were in the sigmoid colon, 10.5% descending, and 5.3% in the rectum. Here's where it kind of got interesting. The duration of surgery for these patients, the mean time was 278 minutes, which roughly is about four hours and 38 minutes. But when we divided it based on the surgery, that four hours and 38 minutes, that's actually for all surgery, left-sided, right-sided, rectal, et cetera. But when we divided it based on the actual sides, we noticed that the right hemicolectomies as well as the sigmoid colectomies were actually a bit shorter in time as, co as compared to the left hemicolectomies in the low anterior section. When we looked at the number of nodes harvested, we had a mean number of 16 lymph nodes with a standard deviation of eight. Now it's recommended that for open surgery, you should ideally get 12 lymph nodes that allows for adequate staging of these patients so we can know whether or not to give adjuvant therapy. But with laparoscopy, we noticed that we actually got 16 lymph nodes, 